हेलो फ्रेंड्स वी आर गोइंग टू डिस्कस जनरल एनाटॉमी ऑफ द बोन अ वेरी की टॉपिक एंड रिपीटेडली यू विल गेट वन और अदर शॉर्ट नोट फ्रॉम दिस टॉपिक वी आर बेसिकली गोइंग टू डिस्कस टू इम्पॉर्टेंट शॉर्ट नोट इन दिस वीडियो एंड दोज आर इपीफाइसिस एंड इट्स टाइप्स एंड द ब्लड सप्लाई ऑफ द बोन इट्स अ लॉन्ग बोन so these two important topics are covered in this and they are repeatedly asked in different type of examinations especially your writing theory examinations so let's begin with the topic what we are going to see what is a bone what is its composition what are the different types of the bone how they are classified very important parts of a long bone what is that this is the basic you have to know the long bone and its part and then the blood supply of the long bone after we finish this we will go for the epiphysis and different types with their examples and we'll also see few of the clinical anatomy topics which are essential and you should know it while we write this kind of short notes let's begin so all of you know bone is a specialized connective tissue it is a form of connective tissue which has connective tissue fibers in it these are collagen fibers collagen type one is the prevalent type in the bone so collagen fibers is one of the major component and along along with that it has mineralization with the calcium salt so calcium salts and this connective tissue which is called as collagen fiber in case of the bones it is type 1 collagen fiber does it have any other cell yes it also have some of the phosphorus salt that is uh, the blending of calcium and phosphate we have calcium phosphate calcium carbonates and different types of cells which are there so two third of the bone is nothing but the mineralized component and it requires calcium in it it imparts hardness or the firmness to this bone and that is why we have strength in our bone okay many people feel bone or do not have the blood vessels because it is too hard and people you know uh, if they have not uh, read anatomy they will believe that bone is a vascular but it is not the case it is exactly reverse bone is a very vascular structure it has a lot of blood vessel in it and actually because of the blood vessels only the bone forms the bone formation is incomplete or it cannot happen if there is no blood vessels so remember blood ves uh, vessels are very key in the development of the bone and uh, it is a very vascular structure it supports our body body framework it has a supportive function it has a protective function it is hemopoietic in nature because your blood is produced inside the bone so it is hemopoietic tissue and it is obviously the storehouse of the calcium and the phosphorus there is something called as resilience so this resilience is nothing but the ability to resist the forces which will break the bone that means in other words it is a property of flexibility so resilience is nothing but a flexibility everybody needs to have the flexibility and why not bones bones need to be flexible in order to prevent the fracture and generally we don't fracture okay only in the event of excessive forces applied over the bone they will break down otherwise they are very resilient thanks to our collagen fiber type 1 this is the organic component and this mineralized calcium is the inorganic component of the bone if you remove the calcium from the bone only the collagen will remain and it is so flex flexible like a rubber that you can tie a knot out of it okay even in other case if you remove whole of the collagen from the bone only the ashes will remain okay we'll see the types of bone and these are very commonly asked in the exam you should know in the theory as well as in the practicals that this slide is key okay now see first and basic type you should know there are two types oven or lamellar okay oven 
either it will be a ovum or lamellar these are opposite ends ovum is a immature bone lamella is a mature bone okay in the ovum bone you will find this kind of bone at very rare places whenever in the you know newborn newborn you will have ovum bones and slowly these bones will be converted into the lamellar kind of bones whenever there is a fracture you will have ovum kind of bone initially form there we call that kind of bone is callus the callus form at the fractured site at the initial period is nothing but the ovum bone whereas our adults bone are generally lamellar they may be compact or cancellous depending on how they are organized in a particular pattern or there is a disorganized pattern or irregular kind of pattern but if there is a lamellar pattern they will be either compact or cancellous okay all the strong bones all the long bones their cortex is compact their shaft is rich in compact bone you will find compact bone located in the shafts you will find in the cancellous bone you will find at the ends of the bone there is a cancellous bone now see if you find a pendicular and axial this kind of skeleton you will find in your practical vivas there will be 10 10 or 5 depending on your you know the universities and uh, the pattern of exam you will have this kind of bone sets kept in the practical viva a pendicular means the limb skeleton including the girdles and axial means the midline skeletal with the vertebra the skull the sternum the ribs and accordingly you will have limb type bone again like synonymous with the appendicular and skull type bone again synonymous with the axial you will have something called as membranous and this will be depending on the origin or the development of the bone so membranous bone or dermal bone and opposite of that is the cartilaginous bone okay what do you mean by this we'll see later on if they develop from a membrane enclosing a connective tissue or they will develop from the cartilaginous cartilaginous model this will determine this kind of you know bone cartilaginous again a limb type and membranous again, again a skull type okay so they are little bit related okay somatic or visceral again the general from the paraxial mesoderm from the mesenchymal tissue connective tissue which gives rise to the somatic kind of bones and those from the neural crest from the uh, mesoderm of your pharyngeal arches if the bones are developing these are known as the visceral bones or the branchial bones so visceral bones are derived from the pharyngeal arches in the head neck region now this classification is important because this is more commonly asked what is a long bone what is a short bone what is a pneumatic bone what is a irregular bone what is a sesamoid bone what is a accessory bone what is a heterotopic bone and this is a commonly asked short bone long bone is the one that transmits the weight okay it has a shaft and two ends short bone is having six surfaces four of them articular two non articular pneumatic bone contains air cavities in them and they are generally related to the again the head and neck okay i would say head only and they have air spaces in it that communicates with the pharynx or nasal cavity so nasal cavity is majority having this communication with the pneumatic bones example is maxilla ethmoid you are frontal sphenoid all these bones okay even the temporal mastoid part they are all pneumatic bones you will have irregular bones you cannot determine the shape they are irregularly shaped bone and vertebra and your uh, few other bones like your sphenoid uh, they are irregular bones okay those bones who are irregularly shaped sesamoid bone are the seed like bone the seeds present in the muscles so few of the muscle tendons few of the muscles tendons they will develop because of the friction these kind of bone called as sesamoid bone 
दे आर एग्जिटिंग देयर एक्शन वाय द मॉडिफिकेशन ऑन द टेंडोन एंड दे विल चेंज यू नो द लिटिल बिट ऑफ द फोर्स ऑफ एक्शन द पैटर्न ऑफ द मूवमेंट दे मे चेंज ओके सो सीस्मॉइड बोन मे रेजिस द प्रेशर एक्जर्टेड ओवर द टेंडोन एंड लाइक वाइज दे हैव अ डिफरेंट काइंड ऑफ फंक्शन बट बिकॉज ऑफ द रिपीटेड फ्रिक्शन these kind of bone develop in the repeatedly acting tendons which are getting friction over a bony surface over adjacent area okay so these are seismoid bones the largest seismoid bone in the body is the patella accessory bones are developing from the extra centers of ossification and they are uh, actually unfused part of some some kind of bone specially they are observed in the skull supernumerary they are also known as supernumerary bone or accessory bones and they are also known as vermian's bones okay vermian bone are the accessory bones develop in the skull because of the faulty ossification or the extra center of ossification giving rise to a piece of bone heterotopic bone is again a bone developing in the soft tissue because of the hemorrhage the blood get calcified and you get this kind of heterotopic bone classical example is in the is a fibula developing in the gastrocnemius okay so in the one of the head of the gastrocnemius you will have that bone called as fibula and it may develop anywhere in any of the muscle tissue any of the soft tissue you may have heterotopic bone and uh, there will be again a calcified small nodules okay it is just not in the tendon like the seismoid bone so these are this is the classification you should be uh, you know aware of and uh, they are commonly asked in your practical vivas as well as for the short notes for uh, mcq they may be asked okay with this hand diagram we can just observe here that this is a structure of your osteon a central canal called as haversian canal and this canal actually gives you know passage to this blood vessel which nourish this cells by the diffusion okay and this cell in in turn will produce the necessary material which is actually necessary for the formation of the bone so these are your osteocytes these are the osteocytes and they have their processes which are you know they are uh, uniting with each other they are connecting with each other you know they are in communication with each other through this canaliculi which are there and together this round structure formed by a concentric ring formed by this osteocytes which are encircling this central canal called as haversian canal and this structure is known as a lamella such 7 to 8 lamella may encircle around the your central canal or the haversian canal which has the neurovascular structure inside that and if this kind of structure is there inside a bone with the parallel such osteons or lamella structure we call that kind of bone as the compact bone if that is a parallelly arranged osteon okay and if they are irregularly arranged we call that kind of bone as the cancellous bone so these two major types we have to know at the ends of the bone you have the cancellous bone and at the shaft of the bone you have the compact bone and what is the difference difference is in the arrangement of the osteon this is more strong parallelly arranged haversian system and there is a haversian system in this but it is irregularly arranged and there are little bit of fragile okay so this irregularly arranged plates or the spicules of the bone we call this kind of bone as the cancellous bone i'll again repeat what is the difference between a lamellar and a non lamellar bone you will see you know the details of this in the histology lectures but 
For now, in the general, you just remember in the lamellar bone there is a presence of haversian system, and they are compact bones. Okay, in the non-lamellar bones there is no haversian system. Okay, and they are immature or oval bone, and they are very uniform bone. There is no particular pattern of arrangement of lamella, so no lamella is formed. A randomly arranged collagen fibers the haversian canal is not there so this is immature bone whereas your compact as well as cancellous bone they are actually the mature bone they may be compact or cancellous and they will have the haversian system how the haversian system is present that will determine the compact or cancellous nature of that bone and adult skeleton generally have a lamellar pattern of bone okay so remember this now this is another hand drawn diagram and i feel this is very important that you focus on this diagram that you understand what is described what are the parts of this bone because this is the key concept you have to know a long bone has a shaft and two ends okay a long bone has a shaft and two ends the shaft is known as diaphysis okay shaft is known as diaphysis whereas the end of the bone generally we call it as epiphysis and at both end both end you can see the epiphysis at many places the end will be covered by a articular cartilage which is a high line type of cartilage so articular cartilage is present at the end of the bone this is the high line cartilage we will see the different types of cartilage in the next class in the upcoming videos so be with that okay so just see now for here this is the shaft and these are the epiphysis epiphysis covered by the cartilages we are not too much worried about this cartilages for now but we are worried about or we are concerned about this epiphysis and shaft and why they are important inside the bone you have a cavity called as marrow cavity where you will have production of the all kinds of blood cells okay and these cells are again derived from the mesenchymal cells your bone cells are again derived from the mesenchymal cells this is the shaft this is the epiphysis or the end of the bone and now this marrow may be a yellow marrow or a red marrow depending on the age of that person in the old age the yellow marrow is predominant and the in the young age the bone marrow contains all the red bone marrow in the red bone marrow there is a hemopoietic tissue your bone is also covered by a membrane a fibrocellular membrane it is known as periosteum this is very important don't forget this periosteum is the one layer of the bone that is fibrous as well as cellular in nature the superficial layer is fibrous the deep layer is the cellular again these are the the points with regard to the histological structure but in the general anatomy you also know this periosteum and what is the importance of this periosteum it is a regenerative area of the bone this is the part of the bone which undergoes regeneration means if this layer is not there your bone cannot regenerate if there is a fracture here if the periosteum is worn off the torn off or it goes away somehow this area will not unite properly there is there is a failure of regeneration union of those cells with each other so the periosteum intact periosteum is essential for the proper union of the fracture okay and it has osteoprogenitor cell in it remember now there is a third part you should be aware of one is the diaphysis other is the epiphysis and at the junction of these two you have the end of the diaphysis which is called as metaphysis metaphysis is the area where there is another presence of a very important articular uh, i would say growing plate okay so metaphysis is the area again you have a cartilage plate there which is also known as growth plate why this epiphysial plate or growth plate or you know, the, the 
cartilage plate which is present in the metaphysis is important because this plate gives rise to the vertical growth or the growth in the length of the bone and that is why you should be aware of this articular uh, not articular this is the growth plate which is again a hyaline cartilage but this grows vertically okay interstitial growth of the cartilage leads to the lengthening of the bone and as long as this plate of cartilage jab tak ye plate rehti hai cartilage ki bone badhte rehta hai growth mein okay periosteum lays down layers of the bone known for the oppositional growth so aisa wala jo growth hai wide or the in the thickness the bone will grow by the deposition of the bone by the periosteal uh, you know deep cellular layer and the osteoblast which are laying down the lamellae there but this lengthwise it grows by the lengthening of your cartilage so these are your epiphyses this is your shaft the diaphysis this is the metaphysis and this is your uh, another cavity called as marrow cavity see this cavity inside is lined by endosteum another regenerative layer it is very much like the periosteum you have similar layer inside okay only cellular component is there and inside also you have progenitor cells osteoprogenitor cell now now see sometimes your bones grow directly from a connective tissue okay your blood vessel brings uh, the necessary cells which are uh, starting directly to produce the bony tissue laying down of bony lamellae or the osteoid and sometimes it comes indirectly via a cartilaginous model and depending on how the bone is produced you have something called as the types of ossification the ossification is nothing but the formation of the bone so formation of the bone is two types one is you have something called as membranous and the other is you call it as cartilaginous now again see the the bone and their uh, parts epiphyseal plate or we call it as growth plate or the cartilaginous plate epiphysis the diaphysis and metaphysis so it is though the name is epiphyseal plate it is present in the metaphysis okay and this is a cartilaginous plate as well and this is your epiphysis this is your articular cartilage at the end of the bone okay now see we'll see what are the different arteries that supply this blood to the bone and this actually leads to the bone formation okay so we'll see it in detail now this is repeatedly asked short note in many types of exam be it your internal or the university exam this is one of the very important topic what is the blood supply of a long bone okay and long bone means the two ends epiphysis one is the diaphysis that is the shaft and it's covering the periosteum if you know this basic idea you can any time write this okay there is a artery that pierces initially at the site where the bone is about to be formed and this artery brings the initial cells osteoblast that lays the lamella and this artery is known as nutrient artery if this artery isn't there your bone will never be formed so nutrient artery pierces through it you can observe here okay this artery is the nutrient artery piercing through the bone again dividing into ascending and descending branch inside the bone it redivides and around that you whatever structure i have described earlier the haversian system is formed so this bone formation is through a initial obliquely you know a uh, directed artery piercing through this artery through this periosteal collar and this bud along with the initial capillary loop of this artery and the osteoblast it is known as periosteal bud and this eventually grows it starts laying down of the bone there and this point where initially there is the formation the starting point of your bone formation it is known as 
primary ossification center and this gives rise to the diaphysis or the shaft of the bone remember this is very important that you know that the shaft or the diaphysis of the bone is actually formed by the primary center of ossification and this is generally supplied by the nutrient artery every bone has a nutrient artery you will study as you go along okay and later on in the adult life this artery nourishes the bone from the inside the inner two third of the cortex you observe here the artery is going inside branching and it is supplying the inner side of your bone it is supplemented by some other arteries at the epiphyseal end okay whenever you are young whenever a person is young the nutrient artery and its branches at the metaphysis they form the end arteries they do not anastomose with this artery they do not form any communication with this arteries called as epiphyseal arteries which supply your epiphysis they remain separate these are the end arteries and there are hairpin bands at this metaphysis and that is why the lodgement of the infections the bacteria the viruses the emboli different blood clots may lodge there and this side becomes very much prone for the infections called as osteomyelitis so osteomyelitis is the infection of the bony tissue and if this happens this is a you know it's a serious condition you have to treat it with antibiotics and you have to look after the kid it may affect the growth of the kid as well okay but why this is common in the kids because your these arteries are the end arteries in the pubertal till the pubertal period unless this plate goes off when there is a full growth of the bone and this plate will go off and these two will unite the epiphyseal and the nutrient artery the metaphyseal branches of that when they unite together you don't have that you know you don't have that risk of osteomyelitis in the adults so remember we see nutrient artery the first artery that supply the bone then you see the periosteal artery it supply the outer one third of the cortex epiphyseal artery we have just seen that it supplies the epiphyseal ends and the four arteries the metaphyseal artery few of the assisting branches from the surrounding systemic artery which supply the surrounding area they also supply the epiphyseal end the growth plate of the uh, the cartilage is nourished by the diffusion there okay so these are all arteries are contributing to the blood supply of the bone and then thereby they are also responsible for the growth of the bone remember this periosteal arteries will supply the periosteum the outer one third of the bone okay so this blood supply is important the applied anatomy of the osteomyelitis is important and you should also comment there the the nutrient artery where it reaches for the first time and it lays down the lamella primary centers before birth they appear before birth they are important secondary center getting your epiphyseal arteries from the surrounding arteries piercing through this for foramina over the cancellous bone they are again important so you write this applied anatomy points as the centers of ossification and the important that osteomyelitis and what is its important hairpin you know the arteries which are there the end arteries in the metaphysis so all these points has to be covered and you have to draw the diagram in the in the exam now there is an important concept ossification what is it it is the bone formation process we'll see this in briefly it's two types mainly membranous and cartilaginous okay if if there is a mix if a bone shows a mix variety it will be third type called as membrano cartilaginous model or the ossification so membranous is one where your bone formation is in a membrane the membrane contains enclosed in it the primitive mesenchymal cell which directly get you know converted into the bone so mesenchymal connective tissue transforming or getting converted into the bone this kind of ossification is known as membranous 
generally your flat bones the skull bones they actually have this kind of ossification so classical example is the skull bones you also have few other bones like the sternum the part of your ribs the part of your scapula the part of your mandible the part of your clavicle these bones also show this kind of membranous ossification but skull cap particularly the upper half of the skull they show this kind of membranous ossification cartilaginous is all long bones show the cartilaginous ossification okay what is the primary ossification center and what is the secondary ossification center one center that that are that is formed before the birth generally in the 8th week of the intrauterine life is the primary ossification center we have just now seen that how that nutrient artery pierces through that bone and it brings the necessary blood with the osteoprogenitor cell transforming themselves into the osteoblast and they form the bone there such center is known as primary ossification center it gives rise to the diaphysis or the shaft of the bone there is a secondary center as well that comes after the birth generally this center forms epiphysis or the end of the bone and depending on which center appears first this center fuses the last with the primary center as a law the secondary center which appears first fuses with the diaphysis or the primary center derived bone at the end but this is called as the law of ossification what it says is the secondary center secondary ossification center which appears first fuses last with the part of the bone that is derived from the primary center that is the diaphysis but in few cases in particular in one case this law is not obeyed and your lower end of the fibula does not follow this law where a secondary center which appears first fuses first and because that is a pressure epiphysis okay we'll see what are the epiphysis and what are its type okay later on so membranous ossification is the one where the bone is formed directly from the mesenchymal tissue enclosed in a connective tissue membrane skull cap bones ribs membranous ossification you know they are derived from that one they are also known as this kind of bones are also known as dermal bones and they are maintaining mainly the hemopoiesis they are protective in nature at some places okay cartilaginous or endochondral ossification is nothing but where the bone is formed through the preformed cartilaginous model that is again derived from the nothing but the mesenchymal tissue a cartilage model is composed of hyaline cartilage remember this important point hyaline cartilage is the precursor of your bony format okay so hyaline cartilage first appears then it is destroyed and then you get at the place of that cartilage there is the bone formation exactly in the same shape okay so they are replaced by the bone in the later part of the life limb bones are classical example of this endochondral ossification and they are very stronger and thicker as compared to the bones derived from that cartilaginous ossification next important concept is about epiphysis because a very repeatedly asked question and many people still struggle you know at the end of your uh, first mbbs or say first year of any medical course this is a very important question that comes in the theory exam for 2 4 5 marks whatever you guys okay epiphysis is the end of the growing bone the secondary center generally gives rise to this part of the bone we call it as epiphysis so it is the end of the growing bone that is derived from the secondary center of ossification and this is known as epiphysis so this is very important that you know what is epiphysis nothing but a, a part of a bone 
and it is generally one end okay a part of the bone okay that is derived from the secondary center depending on its function origin or the way they appear they are classified as into four types a pressure epiphysis a traction epiphysis a tavistic epiphysis and the aberrant epiphysis why pressure because this is present at the ends of the bone which are taking part in the joint formation wherever there is a joint at the end of that you will have at least two bones forming the joint and depending on that location the articular ends of that bone we call it as the pressure epiphysis which are example of that classical example is the head of the humerus articulating with the glenoid cavity of the scapula so that head of the humerus is nothing but the pressure epiphysis okay even the head of the femur forming the hip joint is that pressure the condyles of the femur and tibia are again the pressure epiphysis traction epiphysis is very different than the pressure you should not confuse in between these two they are very common and they are seen grossly okay traction epiphysis is present at the sites where muscles and the tendons attach over the bone and generally their traction gives rise to this kind of epiphysis we call it as traction epiphysis why you have certain tubercles over the humerus produced by the attachment of some muscles called as the rotator cuff muscles you will understand that when you see the humerus okay you have trochanters over the femur which again gives rise to lot of muscles okay in the latter part of your first mbbs you will definitely again see the femur and all its attachment there you will see the trochanters these are the bony projections the bony processes which gives attachment to the muscles in the tendons and that is why this kind of part of the bone arising from this secondary center which attaches all these muscles and tendon and in a way is a traction site so that is why it is known as traction epiphysis now there is a third type and very uh, important because uh, the, there are very few examples of it and repeatedly asked in the mcq or in the viva is a atavistic epiphysis where phylogenetically different part of a bone fuses with the main bone in the humans see coracoid process is a different bone in the quadrupeds if you observe the scapula do not possess coracoid process this is a separate bone in that but in the humans coracoid process is a part of the scapula if such a fusion is occurring in the evolutionary process in the humans there are two bones coracoid process of the scapula and the os trigonum of the talus is the posterior end of the talus lateral process you find it fused with the talus and this bone is the os trigonum of the talus it is a different bone in the lower animals and that is why this type of processes this type of part of the bones which are arising from secondary centers which were supposed to be different bone in certain animals they are not in the humans they are the part of some important bones main bones they are known as atavistic epiphysis there are few places where certain epiphysis appear abruptly at some abnormal i would say or unexpected sites presence of epiphysis at such unusual site or location they are known as aberrant epiphysis what are aberrant epiphysis there is only one example with uh, this is uh, not the head at the base of first metacarpal you have the aberrant epiphysis because normally the heads of the other metacarpals remember heads of the second third fourth fifth metacarpal in your hand do possess the epiphysis whereas this is will say this is the base okay this is this is actually the base of the first metacarpal where you 
possess this kind of i would say uh, aberrant epiphysis okay so remember four types with their examples you have to write and you have to draw certain diagram like i have tried attempted you can draw better than me i am sure the young generation is very much uh, creative in their in their proceedings okay now see th this is our tibia okay and the tibia has upper end with a tuberosity in front a lower end with a projection on the medial side and a lower end have a articular area as well now tibial condyles have the articular area they will be classified as pressure epiphysis but a rough process giving attachment to a tendon called as ligamentum patelli will be classified as tibial tuberosity will be classified into traction epiphysis okay similarly the medial end of the lower end will be a traction epiphysis it gives attachment to the ligaments and the lower articular area will again be a pressure epiphysis so you can draw this kind of diagram just to get one bonus mark a complete five marks you will get if you draw this kind of diagram okay and if you have to write the examples as well at times the epiphysis may not be visible as they they are there they may be unfused they may be separate bones as we have seen in the types of bone they may gives rise to the accessory bones okay that's all part and parcel of the variations that you observe in the anatomy but this is how generally the epiphysis are divided into four categories and you have to make sure you know that very well there is something called as remodeling of the bone and uh, as a medicos you should be aware of this term because uh, remodeling is a key concept in the bone and when i uh, when i mean a bone it is bone growth it is uh, intimately related to the bone and its uh, shape and its uh, growth and overall turnover in the bone is controlled by this process which is called as remodeling of the bone what is this remodeling this is continuous formation and resorption of the bone there are two cells in the bone that you should be aware of one is osteoclast osteoclast are the cells responsible for the bone resorption and other are osteoblast which are bone forming cell see under different hormonal influence response to the injury or some miscellaneous influence the bone continuously change its metabolic activity and this process of continuous formation and resorption of the bone is known as remodeling this is continuous process when whenever you are whatever you are doing this is going on this is a lifelong process calcitonin a hormone and a parath hormone these two hormones you know interchangeably they are regulate continuously they are regulating your blood calcium level by exerting their effect on the bone forming or bone resorbing cells and these cells are the osteoblast and the osteoclast say calcitonin reduces the blood calcium that means it utilizes that calcium in forming the bone so calcitonin will activate your osteoblast and it will reduce the activity of the osteoclast thereby reducing the blood calcium whereas opposite action is done by the parath hormone which will increase the blood calcium level we have already seen what is a osteomyelitis and osteomyelitis is the infection of the bone very common in the kids because of the reason that the end arteries gives enough site for the lodgement of that bacteria viruses and the at times the emboli osteoarthritis is the inflammation of the bone okay in the old age this is common in the especially the rheumatoid uh, arthritis osteoarthritis is old age degeneration of the articular cartilage giving rise to that inflammation of the bone fracture is a break in the continuity of the bone 
you are all aware of this and the result of fracture the bone breaks and there is again a renewal because of the periosteum secondary center of ossification can be helpful in the legal age determination in some cases of the medico legal importance still births are the births you know the dead uh, child is uh, getting birth and it is known as uh, still birth when uh, the the fetus is still dead and if uh, there is a suspicion over the death or the age of that uh, baby this secondary center of the lower end of the femur generally this is the exception of the secondary centers which are coming before the birth the secondary center of ossification for the lower end of the femur helps in the determination of that age which is around the 9th month and thereby it tells the examiner that this baby was supposed to live this baby was a viable age baby it could have lived and there is a possibility of you know any foul play there it is conditional but in such cases that gives you the approximate age of that born baby okay dead born or still born baby you call it epiphyseal lines how to identify and how to differentiate that from the fracture is a key concept in your radiological photographs epiphyseal lines are the growth lines they are often bilateral and they are linear in appearance it will be present on the right side as well as on the left side of this same person see oftenly fracture lines are unilateral at the affected side only they will be present and they will be having a irregular age any randomly oriented age will be there with the fracture line you will observe on the x ray films that we have a picture from the Keith Moore clinical anatomy and you observe here the epiphyseal lines both of the radius and the ulna you see the epiphyseal lines you can also observe the first base of the first metacarpal we co call it as the aberrant epiphysis at the base here and the rest you find it at the head and that is why this is a case of aberrant epiphysis so this kind of findings you see again you see this uh, base of the first metacarpal you see again the aberrant epiphysis these are the epiphyseal lines of again the radius and the ulna okay so these are the few things you need to know when you study the bone general anatomy i guess i have covered the important topics exam point of view what are important things you need to know and whatever your queries if you want to specifically highlight a few things you can ask in the comment okay thank you very much for watching the video do like subscribe and share as much as you can thank you